all over. I have the great pleasure of having uh, Judith Black with me. Welcome to the show, Judith. Thank you. Good to be here. Oh, you know, every time I, um, I have a show, I write up a series of questions that I'm going to ask. Where are I they? Have nothing. I have nothing <laughs> because I know that we're just going to chat. And, um, and I know that you're a very... Uh, well-positioned, intelligent person, and I'm so happy to have you with us. I, I wish and, my mother was alive to hear that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, uh, when did you first say or realize the world's got a problem? Okay, so, and you don't know, you're kind of, when I did it, I did a TED Talk once, and on the same platform that day was somebody who was talking about blues and reds and said you are born with either conservative or liberal tendencies, which mm -hmm. was fascinating. Yeah. And the, the argument was you need both. You need people to protect the village, and you need people to let new ideas in. Yeah, but, I've heard about that, and in, in, it's in the brain, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I've always been an environmental advocate. My poor kid growing up, I would never buy goodie bags for his birthday. So I say, honey, this crap just ends up in the solid waste. He goes, mom... I said, we'll get a $5 gift certificate for every child who comes to a worthy nonprofit that you get to choose. Mom, I'm going to end up at a therapist because of you. <laughs> the fact that at five he knew what a therapist was, I thought he was in good shape. He's done just fine. And then, you know, so you, you march along and you yeah. do what you can. You go, packaging is horrible. Plastics are horrible. And then I read... This changes everything, the end of nature, the sixth extinction, and all of E.O. Wilson in a row. So I go to my husband, honey, get me a catheter. I'm on the couch for the duration, which turns out to be not nearly as long as any of us had hoped. And you couldn't go back. I mean, yeah. once you get it. I basically stopped my career and started as a climate activist, trying to integrate it. Now, about how long ago would you say? Uh, 12 years, 15. 12, 12, 15 years ago, yeah. And um, and then you, what, you dedicated your life to it, or what? Well, so my work is, and people go, I'm a professional storyteller. And in, inevitably, you finish That's a why gig. I didn't bring any, right. any notes with me. So yeah. You finish a gig, and a little old lady comes up and goes, from this you make a living. And I go, well, yeah, kind of. Yeah. I mean, the most interesting work is, of course, getting commissions to create stories. But yeah. you, the nice thing is, you never have to tell a story you don't believe in or you don't care about. Mm. And so if you have theatrical skills, you know, if that's your tool bag, then you can incorporate them and do something you care passionately about. So then you, um, you're, did you join an organization? Or? Yeah. Oh, God, this is so interesting. So yeah. then you realize you are not going to stop the climate crisis on your own. You know, that individual actions, as nice as they are, yes, aren't going to do absolutely. it. So you go shopping. You know, yeah. you shop for an organization. Like, you know, I said, oh, Sierra Club, they're really nice. Oh, EDF. But they're all top down. Right. And I'm not a good foot soldier. Yeah. I'd get a feeling you're not either. Well, I, I do support those organizations <laughs> oh, as well, Greenpeace. Right, Wildlife, I support yeah. them, but you don't have a voice in them. Right. You know, the, and they have great initiatives. My, thank God the Sierra Club, they were the ones that brought the Peaker plant to our attention. But uh, I, this, is, this is the uh, Peaker plant in Peabody. Yeah. The, and a Peaker plant is something that, um, that is used uh, when... When there's high demand. Right. right. So like at yeah. 5 o'clock every night on really yeah. hot or really cold nights, everyone comes home and turns on every appliance they have. So your base load no longer works. You need peak load. And that's yeah. when they fire up these right. plants. Right. And they're hideous. Mm -hmm. um, they Most of them fu function on oil and gas. The irony being they say, well, it's primarily gas, which is much cleaner. Methane, 80 times more potent of a greenhouse gas, always leaking. But also gas doesn't move well in the winter, so they're back to oil. Yeah. It's just great. So the Sierra Club, God bless them, did, really? did alert them to that. So the first, I found my organization. But, but, but unfortunately, they they built it. They what? They built this people. They plant. didn't build it yet. They're building, They're building it, it now. They're building it, yeah. But, yeah, but, I mean, and we've been fighting it for over two years. Yeah. Oh, but I want to finish the story about I'm finding sorry. your organization. <laughs> I'll keep him on. Yeah. I'll keep him on track. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> so the first time I walked into a 350 North Shore meeting, right. I looked around and I said, old anarchists. These are my people. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and I found out, like, as, as I had been arrested at the site of the Seabrook nuclear power plant, so had many of them. There was just, and you mentioned this when we were schmoozing before, 
you want a camaraderie and comfort level where you're going to spend most of your time. Yeah. And then you're willing to branch out. You're willing to go places you're uncomfortable with. You're willing to create liaisons and bridges. But that home place is important, and that became my home place. Yeah, so you're wearing you're wearing the, uh, <laughs> the bright T-shirt. So uh, three fifty. Um, oh, give us um, give us the history of the organization. Well, three fifty dot org began yeah. with Bill McKibben, who teaches up at Middlebury College, and he yeah. was the fellow who wrote The End of Nature and has gone on to write many things. Well, a brilliant writer, oh, by yeah. the way. I just love his writing. Yeah, and a brilliant man. And you know the word mensch. Yes, yes, of course. So for those who don't yeah. know, Mensch is Yiddish for a real human being. Yeah. So when Michael Moore skewered him in that awful movie, did you see the one he did? No. Absolutely. Skewering him and Al Gore for oh. their blah, 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 hypocrisy. Blah, and his facts were really old and really inappropriate. Yeah. And these are two people who have tried to change our world. Um, yeah. And I know, you know, and so I wrote to Bill. And I said, I've had bad reviews, too. Don't worry about it. It'll pass. Your work is really important. He wrote back to me. Yeah. And I found out that he wrote a personal note back to every person who wrote to him. Yeah. So yeah, he's the real deal. A uh, great, great human being. By the way, I listened to Al Gore just uh, a few days ago speaking uh, in uh, New York. Uh, at a conference. He was really good. He was very uh, um, on top of all the information and facts. Yeah. He had it in for for um, the uh, the head of the World Bank. Oh, uh, who doesn't? Yeah, and, uh, and unfortunately the poor guy had to speak a little bit after him. The poor, <laughs> I shouldn't call him a poor guy. Yeah. Anyway, so, so you, find, you like found uh, uh, 350. And just say, Al Gore did start CCL. My friend Rob Bonney. Oh, C- what is CCL? Citizens Climate. Uh-oh. Citizens uh, Climate. <laughs> they work for carbon taxing. All right. I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll, which, yeah. I'm sorry, Rob. <laughs> which has really worked. They actually in, use carbon taxing in British Columbia, and it's brought carbon level, levels down enormously. So, so one of the things that I've noticed uh, about all these groups, uh, Extinction Rebellion, 350.org, uh, Sierra, they all... Uh, work together, um, and some are uh, up and down. So the Sunrise Movement uh, was really big, but it seems to have, have uh, I don't know, uh, uh, on the wane a bit, right? The, the yeah. people who started it aged out. They, aged <laughs> they don't out. let people it's over a, it's 35. A, it's, a young, it's a young people's uh, uh, group. Yeah, time to but they, they had a big, big impact on When they on sat in Nancy Pelosi's office. Yeah. yeah. So we're also talking, we're saying, well, what's an effective kind of activism. Mm. What really works? Uh, if I knew, I'd be doing it. You know. <laughs> I mean, we're throwing... I know at 350, we do all kinds of work. We do legislative advocacy. We do direct action. We do education. We have a campaign now to try to get our DPU to actually... For three years, communities have been waiting for their applications to use alternative energy <laughs> to be okay by them. Three years for community aggregation okay. So that's insane. All they have to do is go, sure. So these communities could have been investing in renewable energy, supporting the industry, bringing clean energy into their town, but our DPU is dysfunctional because it is Baker's DPU. And also there's no way to interact with them. All you can do is send a complaint letter. I mean, there's no, no way you can advocate, you can talk to yeah. them, you can understand how they're thinking. Yeah. And what about um, like advocacy? So I was, um, uh, uh, and I'll take it up in a little while again. Uh, we ha- are going to present something in the um, Boston State House, the Massachusetts State House, uh, a, a bill for. It's actually um, it's called uh, Carbon Dioxide Removal Leadership Act (CDRLA), and it's to fund. Um, to removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Anyway, uh, I thought that that was an effective thing, but a lot of activists say we can't, you know, you can't work with these people, uh, you can't write to them, they don't listen to you. What's your opinion about that? I think there's room for everything in the picture. So carbon sequestration and storage, 
One of the reasons I think activists get oh, married... Oh, that's, that's, that's different. Oh, it is. Oh, okay. that's different. Uh, there's two things. Okay. There's carbon dioxide removal, which is taking the carbon out of the atmosphere, and carbon sequestration and removal, which is uh, to take, we're putting something on the smokestack that takes uh, the carbon out, and, um, and it, it's, uh, it's a mitigation process. That is, it doesn't let carbon into the well, atmosphere. One of the fears the are that, you know, if, if you, you say that's what we care about, that everyone will just keep behaving like they always have, burn fossil fuels up the yin-yang, and say, don't worry, the, car the carbon sequestration and storage that's people right. are going to take right. care of it. The, the, the oil companies really love this, so, but they don't, uh, they don't, there's very few plants that have carbon sequestration because it's very expensive. It's a couple of hundred a um, million dollars to put in, huh? and you have to have it in a place where you can sequester the carbon, otherwise you have to uh, deliver out, and that's a geological, there are many of them, and, but it the has to be. the same place that we put all the, um, all the returns from our nuclear power plants. Yes, yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and actually, actually, you know who, who knows about this the most is the oil companies, and they have the ability to do it. And, and I'm going to say something heresy here. Uh, we have to work with the oil companies. Uh, and I know this, this breaks your heart because they've been so, so horrible. They have been but so horrible. But isn't that a huge question? Yeah. Do you look at these corrupt systems and say, oh, my God, we don't have enough time to create completely new systems? Do we work with these people that have knowingly poisoned our planet and poisoned their communities? And I think, I don't know if there's a choice at this point. Yeah. We're, we're close to the end. Well, I think you, you said it right, is that we, we have to work with every, we have to work in all fronts. We have to um, uh, work with the legislature, the activism. I mean, um, what kind of activism do you believe in or does 350.org believe in? Ah, well, yeah. one arm of 350.org is called Climate Courage. And our initiatives tend to be a little edgier than, than 350 as an organization, and yet we are sponsored by them. So we do the Chase Bank protests. Yes. Go ahead, ask me, why do you protest Chase Bank? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll tell you. Right, <laughs> they have put over $300 billion into the fossil fuel industry since the Paris climate talks. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so what was it? A number of weeks ago, the Globe had a, a big to-do, you know, they speakers from all over the world showing how we could enter world peace. And who was one of them? Jamie Dimon, the CEO of Chase. And when you looked at the fine print, you saw, oh, Chase is sponsoring this event. Mm -hmm. It's sort of, no. Nah. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really hard. So for instance, we had a campaign, tear, tear up your Chase card, make a little video of cutting it up and send it to Chase and say, no, you need, and don't let greenwashing fool you. You know, they do little initiatives that make it look yes, as if they've they, changed yes. behavior. Oh, they all they have not. Yeah. Right. Procter and Gamble and how what they do up in the Northwest in um in Canada. Yeah. With Virgin Forests. Yeah. Right. They have uh, little I think initiatives. I, I'm I'm gonna call out um um the insurance companies <clears throat> on this, right? Well, and those are the three objectives. Right. So, so that insurers should not insure pipelines like Liberty Mutual. Liberty Mutual banks is the big one. Banks yeah. should not bank them, yeah. and the investment companies should not sell them. So BlackRock is the biggest investment firm in the country, maybe the world, and they still invest in uh, Well, so how do, we get, how do we get Chase, I um, mean, sitting in, outside the office... Uh, which a lot of people have done, um, <laughs> doesn't do my, I mean, it's, it's not the big office, it's just a, a branch office. You know. How do we get Chase or Liberty Mutual uh, to stop doing what they're doing? How? We make sure there's no money for them. That's the only thing that'll stop them. Mm, mm. Um, I don't think there's any conscience there. I think they live in a silo where making profit is the only thing that's yeah, important. Yeah. So unless you hit their bottom line, I don't see that they're going to change, yeah. which is why we said, you know, cut up your chase card. Don't mm -hmm. do business with these people. It worked on a smaller level in South Africa. Yeah. Um, so, so I just want to say that this is a report from the climate crisis. I'm uh, Camille Nasser. This is uh, Judith Black. And we, we talk every every couple of weeks about what's going on in, in activism in uh, this area, this region.
Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, mm. I don't know what those uh, are. What are you talking about? <laughs> no, we were so, just saying, you know, how, how, how do you how, change it? I mean, we've, we've tried shaming them. I actually wrote to Jamie Dimon and sent him a picture of my granddaughter. Hmm. And I said, I would like her to have a livable climate to grow up in. He didn't write back. Um, and I think they see us as kind of bizarre extremists, so outside the silos they think in that we're like little gnats sometimes. Yeah. But if you get enough gnats, you've got to develop a strategy. And once they address us with a strategy, then you have some power. Well, that's the, the thing I want to bring up, is we don't have enough gnats here. So, gnats. like, there was a big uh, protest in, uh, in the Boston area, and they've been planning it for months. I'm not kidding you. They, were, they started planning this in April, I think, and, uh, and it took place uh, on Wednesday. They got 50 to 100 people. I mean, that's nothing. Whereas in the UK... The uh, Extinction Rebellion there, they got 100,000 people on the streets. It's a, just a whole different mentality. I, uh, what do you think? Is, is America retarded or what, what's the story? Hey, they elected Donald Trump. Oh, yeah. whoops. <laughs> oh, yes, you could be political here. I don't care. <laughs> You'll be political. Uh, no, I, I, I think that we don't get real facts or real truth anymore in our schools that our history is whitewashed, that education has... I have a friend who's a wonderful artist. Her name is Anna Wojcik. And Anna illustrated um, school texts. And they were doing um, Native Americans, and she researched the tribe they were looking at, and she sent all the pictures, and they sent them back and said, you have to put clothes on them. She just had loincloths. Mm -hmm. And she said, but I researched this, and this is how they dress. They said, we will never get it past the Christian majority that looks at every single textbook, and we have to sell textbooks. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we are just stymied for truth so many places. How do we get that back? Yeah, well, so that's, you're, you're raising so many good points here. Uh, and, um, and I always wondered about um, the uh, writing Congress people, and it's, doesn't seem to be uh, good, except when I write my local people, my the local um, your rep, re, my local rep and senator in in the uh, in the Massachusetts. Yeah. I think we can where finish each other's sentences. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when I, then they they write me back, right. whereas when I write. Um, uh, Ed Markey, uh, you know, I mean, I, I love the guy, I mean, but uh, he's, uh, I get, I, there's not any reason, and I've written other people, I've written Republicans, uh, and, 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 I, and I can't, you know, I, there's one thing I can't understand, Judith, you know, this infrastructure, uh, I'm sorry, the Inflation Reduction Act, mm. and, and the infrastructure bill. Uh, the, the, the infrastructure was slightly bipartisan. The uh, the other one, uh, 50 senators voted against the climate. How, how can we change that? How can we possibly um, make some progress if there's so much so much denial there? Okay, yeah. so I came up with an idea. I'm glad you asked because I have an <laughs> idea. <laughs> um, so like you. I end up at protests where you go, where is everybody? Don't we all have children, grandchildren? Don't we want a livable climate? And then people say, I don't think this is effective. Um, I'm hanging my laundry. I bought an EV, whatever. Whatever the single individual act is. Brilliant book, by the way, called Don't Even Think About It, Why the Human Mind Cannot Understand the Climate Crisis mm -hmm. by a British guy. And mm -hmm. one of the things he says is that people feel if they do one they change one personal behavior, they're off the hook. They're good. Yeah. Or another thing he talks about is once you've survived a climate disaster, instead of saying, what caused that? I'm going to work my butt off to make sure that doesn't... No. They say, I'm a survivor and I'm rebuilding. I yeah. mean, what is the psychology that keeps us from getting really involved? Yeah. So evidently, you need 3.5% of the population to turn any issue. Active. 3.5%. Percentage yeah, of the I've heard population. That. I've heard that, yeah. Now, I was just reading my Harper's uh, today, and they said 1% of the American public puts climate as their most important issue. Yeah. Uh, blows mm. us away. Yeah. So you think, okay, 
it's not enough for us to function with our, our organizations. Mm -hmm. We really do need to build that momentum. Yeah. So what I so you start to think, when are peop, people outside of their own information or community silos? When they're on transportation. Oh, uh -huh. Whether it's a subway, a train, or driving. Yeah. I was thinking, what if we had huge billboards and they showed, for instance, Lake Mead in the 1950s and Lake Mead today mm. and said, your climate is in crisis. Contact and just contact, a simple contact to find out what can you do and what can you do at a personal level, what can you do at a political level, what can you do at a social level or a theological level. Um, yeah. Churches and synagogues are organizing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there, there is a lot of activism in, in uh, liberal churches, but most of the conservative churches are just uh, uh, climate-denying uh, left oh and God, right. What's her name? But, you know, you know, I think there's some, there's some hope here because a couple of years ago, uh, the Republicans were denying that there's climate change. Now they've, they're silent. They're not saying, oh, we have to change anything. But they're si that's a change. Yeah, it's like denying. they're backstepping on the abortion <laughs> stuff, too, because they realize it's, it's going to cost them votes. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and, and by the way, this is a report from the climate crisis. I'm Camille Nasser. This is Judith Black. Uh, it's so good to talk to you. As I said, I, I usually prepare what we're going to say, and I know I know Judith uh, a little bit, and I know that she she could just uh, um, talk yeah. about anything, right? So what? I think so. That whole yeah. idea of showing, because images, I think, speak to a very part of your different part of your brain than words. Right. It's like music speaks to a different part of your brain, and. And when you see an image, it has impact. We're old enough to remember the Vietnam War and that amazing image of the child on fire from napalm. Yeah. And how profoundly that affected the entire absolutely, culture. Absolutely, yeah. And I think if, if we could see these images everywhere to say, we used to be able to grow food here. This is what it looks like now. We used to live here. Now it's under 10 feet of water. You know, to see those comparisons and to say, do something, and here, here's just a beginning, yeah. just to get people invested. Mm -hmm. So if you know anybody with a lot of money who would like to bankroll billboards and... Yeah, <laughs> uh, well, uh, that's interesting. Uh, you talk about a lot of money because there was a, a, a study that came out, I think it was done by Stanford University just uh, recently, and they talked about um, <clears throat> how much money, like uh, 350.org, uh, Extinction Rebellion, uh, Sunrise, uh, uh, minimal <laughs> compared to compared to, and they they used uh, conservative think tanks. No, no, no. <laughs> compared to um, Greenpeace and World Wildlife Fund, and I I don't remember the numbers, but it was like some a thousand dollars that um, that World Wildlife Fund gets. Uh, uh, 350 uses a, a dollar, and they and they compared. Over time, how and especially the, what Extinction Rebellion did in England, and uh, they they went uh, to the suffrage movement, the 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 um, uh, civil rights movement, uh, Black Lives Matter, um, uh, anti-Vietnam War, and and they said climate activism is much more effective and should be funded more. Yeah, it's I, it's so interesting. So in in my mind, the only big boy environmental organization that's really stepped up is Sierra Club. And there's a wonderful film about cows, a cowspiracy. And this guy, <laughs> it's called Cowspiracy. It's great. You'll never eat another piece of cow if you watch it. Mm. And this guy just chews into these large organizations. He says, why don't you ever mention meat eating as a source, you know, of both methane and carbon destruction of our forests? And he, and his Conclusion was probably pretty accurate. They don't want to lose any of their donors by offending them. Mm. So they just stay away from those things. And yes, there was a movie that was done uh, sometime about that. I forgot what it was called. Um, yeah, they, they do stay away from them. And, you know, I've been a vegetarian for uh, since I was about 18 years old. And look at that healthy and, palate. <laughs> and... <laughs> and um, uh, and I never, never proselytized for it. I just, I don't want to kill animals. I just don't eat meat. 
Uh, but uh, in the last year or so, when I, I found out what you were saying, how much methane uh, and carbon the cows cows produce, and cows deforestation and, and deforestation, the 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 rainforest in Brazil was destroyed in order to create uh, grazing land, right? And uh, so I think it's really important that we preach uh, uh, vegetarianism, or or I'm sorry, eating less meat if you don't want to be a vegetarian, okay? Do it like Eating Asians, little bits. <laughs> little bits, yeah, or, or much less. And, and you know who supports me are, are the, is the medical pr uh, industry. Every study says eat less meat. Who you knew know? you'd be endorsed by the AMA? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't, uh, because before, when I was a kid, my, uh, when we were kids, um, meat was considered healthy. Right. Well, it's also and a sign of success. Sign of success too, that you're you're rich enough to to afford meat, um, and uh, and uh, so that's that's one thing. There's another thing that that uh, I feel guilty about when I'm on an airplane. Oh yeah. And I don't know. Um, <laughs> I try to take less, but if you want to fly to the Europe, um, you're. Uh, you're going to use a lot of... Yeah. The only way to be pure is to conserve. There's yeah. no action that doesn't require energy. Yeah, but you know, the part of that is the infrastructure. For example, in China, they, uh, in, uh, they don't fly um, uh, uh, very much in, inside the country because they have these very... High-speed high rail. High-speed rail. Europe, you're not allowed to fly anywhere that's less than 200 miles. You have to take the high-speed rail. Where? In Europe. Hello, our ancestors. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, I, I, I didn't even know that rule. Because um, there are flights, there are flights from Rome to Milan. Hmm. <laughs> so I, I, okay. Anyway, well, I have to check on I that. I read but, it in some. Yeah. Anyway, we're, we're we're drawing to a close now. Oh. And it's. It's really so good to have you here. I mean, I wish we could talk some more. This is a report from the cl climate.